Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Uh, my name is Daniel Harvey. I'm the Artistic and Community Manager for Opera Parallel. Um, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this conversation this evening. Um, so just to give you a little context on about why we're here tonight, if you're, if you're not aware, uh, OP is very excited to be presenting our next production, which is called Everest and Immersive Experience, which is opening next Friday, February 3rd at Z Space here in San Francisco. Um, it's running through to February 12th, and there's plenty of different performance times and plenty of great tickets available still. Um, check out our website for those. That's operaparallel.org slash Everest. Um, so to start with, I just want to tell you a little bit about uh, the background of this production. Um, so OP's productions will always take you on a journey. That's guaranteed. Um, and this production itself has had its own journey. Uh, so when this, we started developing the product, the, the sorry, the concept of a graphic novel opera or combining the two mediums of graphic novels and opera together, we decided developing that concept in 2012. Uh, with when our creative director, Brian Stappenbill, and conductor and artistic director, Nicole Paymore, uh, commissioned a, a short opera and did a, presented a workshop performance of that using graphic novel images uh, as part of the, the, the background and the scenery for that workshop. Um, that, that concept sort of was put to bed for a few years in 20, after 2012, uh, but then it was brought back in 2020 during the pandemic. Uh, in 2020, we decided to, to do an excerpt from Everest uh for our virtual gala uh and we did a 10 minute scene uh presented in the style of a graphic novel opera uh and it was it was such a great hit uh people loved it and we we loved it as well uh that we decided to really to keep going and do the whole opera and turn it into a feature length animated film uh which we premiered in 2021 uh with the dallas opera uh and then you know as as opera parallel likes to do we keep pushing ideas further and further and we, we decided to use all of the assets that we created for the film in 2021 and turn it into this immersive experience that, that is opening uh, next week. Uh, so we using all the illustrations, the recording uh, and the performances from our incredible cast and putting them into a full 360 degree projected experience with the audience in the middle uh, and with spatial surround sound design. So it feels like you're really there uh, in, the, in the middle of the action, quite literally in the middle of the action. Uh, so please do make sure you get your tickets for, for that. Um, but before any of that happened, before any before the, before we even had that idea, the, the story really started with our two guests who are here today. Um, so it's my great pleasure to welcome, uh, virtually at least, to Upper Parallel, these two guests to share their incredible stories. Uh, so with us is Jean Shear. Jean Shear is a celebrated librettist, lyricist, and songwriter, uh, and is of course the librettist for the opera Everest. His other operatic works include Therese Rakin with Tobias Picker, Moby Dick and It's a Wonderful Life with Jake Heggie, and Cold Mountain with Jennifer Higdon. Jean, was, Jean also wrote the song American Anthem, which has gone on to become a well-loved part of the contemporary American songbook, uh, and was also recited by President Joe Biden in his inaugural address. Joining Jean in conversation tonight is, of course, Beck Weathers. Beck is, is a retired pathologist based in Dallas, Texas, and author of the book, Left for Dead, My Journey Home from Everest, which describes his incredible experiences as a survivor of the 1996 Mount Everest disaster. Beck and Jean met while Jean was researching and developing the libretto for the opera Everest, and Beck's story's story forms one of the central storylines of the opera. So without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming Jean Shear and Beck Weathers. We started discussing subjects and I had been thinking about um, the story of uh, what happened on Everest in 1996 for a while. Of course, I read the book uh, as many people had because it was a big bestseller, uh, Into Thin Air, John Krakauer's book. So I knew the outline of the story and I, I, I posed the idea to Joby and he was instantly uh, taken with the idea. I think if Joby were here, he would say that the first thing that sort of uh, sort of uh, caught his imagination was the idea of depicting through music what it's like to be in the death zone. That and Beck can speak to what the death zone is, but it's this uh, place at, at a at this very high altitude where it's it's uh, you can't you, there's almost no oxygen and it's very very hard to breathe. And that kind of incredible effort 
to uh, to move your body uh, a few feet was something that uh, Joby thought uh, that music could really explore. Anyway, so I we 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 uh, soon sort of set set on the idea of doing this story. And um, rather than, I had the idea of rather than uh, using John Krakauer's book, I mean, there were other issues with that. I don't think John Krakauer and Speck can speak to this at this point at, at, at time wanted any more to do with uh, the story. Um, there's, there's, I'll let Beck uh, describe that if he wants. Um, uh, but so I decided to go uh, around the country uh, hopefully to go around the country and then go around the world through, there wasn't Zoom, but through telephone calls and the in-person interviews and interview as many um, um, so of the survivors as I could. And, you know, it's uh, what happens is when when someone just phone call, uh, you get a phone call from someone with this crazy idea of doing an opera, uh, it's, and then people are very, very busy and uh, it's, it's very hard to get any sort of purchase, as you say, to get any, uh, you know, uh, anyone to take you seriously, but luckily Beck uh, uh, Beck was uh, uh, was open to the idea. He lives in uh, he lives in Dallas, and it was from the Dallas Opera, and um, he was incredibly generous uh, with his time. And uh, I went over to Beck's house, and we started what turned out to be thirty hours of conversation and multiple visits. And he allowed me to record him, and much of what he said well, wove his whole story, but much of his even his language wove its way into uh, into the opera. So, uh, and then the way it works is once I had Beck, then I could call other people and said, hey, I, I got Beck. And they say, you talked to Beck Weathers? I said, well, then I'll talk to you too. And so I, uh, Neil Beidelman in, in Aspen, I parked my car and I had an hour. He said, I'll give you 30 minutes. And I, and I parked my car in an hour lot, in an hour lot, and four and a half hours later, uh, you know, I, I, I finished my interview with Neil Beidelman, who was one of the guides on the South Pole, and Beck can speak to that story. And then it went on from David Brashears and reaching out to Jan Arnold uh, in uh, New Zealand and, uh, uh, and, 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 and others uh, uh, all the way through. I got, I got through to as many as I could. But, but this whole story started with uh, Beck and his incredible generosity to me. So without further ado, I should uh, have to shut up and let Beck uh, start to tell this story. Beck, I'll ask you, I'll start with this. What was it like when I called you to say, I want to do this? What, what, were you ever thinking this was going to be an opera? Well, I gotta say, of all the many things that came after '96 Everest, I, and there were a lot of unusual uh, appearances. You know, you get to meet the the great and the mighty, and you go all sorts of places. And you can sort of expect in a story that captivates people's imagination the way that particular event did that those were sort of flow-ons that you would uh, think would be perfectly reasonable. But when you called me up. I, that came totally out of the blue, and I was absolutely intrigued just with the whole idea of it. And of course, I we, we sat down and we started talking, and uh, it was such an easy conversation. Uh, it was such a you know, it's just like somebody you'd known your entire life, and you just sit there and you pour your guts out, and you tell your story, and you tell you what you what you were thinking and what got you there, and the, the trials and tribulations, the upsides, the downsides, the the horror and the and the jubilations and all the full gamut of emotions that this kind of a story entails. Uh, and so uh, I still didn't know how this was going to turn out. And eventually you came back with a recording uh, that uh, so I could get a, a listen to how this was going to sound. Uh, and I was so moved. I basically kind of just shook me uh, to the core, and I and I just really uh, had trouble holding it together. It was such an emotional event, hearing the story and done in such a way with such beautiful words and such beautiful music uh, that I you know I thought it was it, it was a singular experience. And then of course we got to see this. Uh, when the opera premiered uh, in uh, Dallas in uh, 2015 and seeing it with the full staging and all the magnificent voices uh, and the great score that goes with it, I was just overwhelmed. And it really is one of the highlights 
of my last years. And, and they've just been wonderful. And I get a chance to see into a world uh, with such creativity and interesting people that was not part of my experience normally. Uh, awesome. But it was, you know, it just a fantastic experience and it turned out to be a great opera. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate that. And if, if it's if it's any of those things, it's in large measure due to your help uh, with it. You know, one of the things I think you all might be interested to know is that, you know, when I'm interviewing someone like Beck or when, I'm, when I interviewed Beck, of course, I wanted to know the story. I wanted to know it from, you know, the, the person who experienced it and and. And I'm sure you actually all know the the basic outline of this story. Uh, we can we can go over that some, but we talked. Beck and I talked a lot about um, his work uh, as a pathologist. I, I asked him things I don't think he was probably because uh, I don't. You, you never know uh, when you're writing what is going to weave its way in, what tributary is going to weave its way into this river that you're uh, that you're you know you know sailing sailing forth on. And so like I'm just one thing that sort of pops to mind as I'm sort of casting my mind back on this was I remember I said, I said, well, Beck, tell me, uh, um, tell me about what you do uh, when you're in the lab. And uh, um, and he was explaining, he, he said to me something which wound up being in the opera when he said, uh, well, you have to understand, Gene, when you're looking at cells and Beck, help me out here. You, you, you can't see them unless you add dyes to them to uh, to, to, to sort of discern what is uh, uh, what's there. And uh, and it seemed and, all, and not I wouldn't say all of a sudden, but as I was doing my work, it seemed like an incredible uh, metaphor for Beck's life, who uh, as he was, you know, he Everest was the dye that allowed him to see and recontextualize his life. I don't want to put words in your mouth, Beck, so you can sort of jump in at any time. But, you know, I think that uh, used uh, with the interesting thing, and maybe you can speak to this, is that you've said in in um, I'm, I'm going to bungle this, but Everest kind of saved your life in a way, uh, and not just the experience of it, but it changed your life. And maybe you could speak to that. Uh, well, I think there's a tendency to look at Everest and see this as just a bunch of ciphers going up there trying to bag a mountain so they can pound their chest uh, and you know d declare themselves to the world, but the reality of the individuals who are there is vastly more complex than any of those kind of simpleton stories would suggest. Because uh, these are real people and every single one of them brings their own hopes and dreams and problems uh, and, and searching for something uh, to in their life to you know, find meaning. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, certainly in my own case, Everest was a long journey to get there. This was not a one year event to go and this suddenly go climb a mountain. This was a very long period. Uh, and it came out of a, uh, a fairly long, lifelong uh, depression and trying to struggle and stay alive during all those uh, years. Uh, and the exertion, uh, and the physical drive was very healing. And that really got expressed in my going into the mountains where just the sheer physical drive would, was calming uh, to me and to my soul and to being able to put out the pain of the day-to-day -day existence. Uh, and so much of what I, you know, was seeing when we were talking, but we were talking about the world that I exist in, which is an artificial one in so many ways, uh, because what I do is an idiot savant skill that has no real uh, counterpart, in essence, in the real world. I, I know what a human being looks like in three dimensions, cut at five microns from birth to resurrection, in health and in thousands and thousands of diseases, and that has absolutely no use whatsoever unless you do what I do. But it's <laughs> all artificial. Uh, and, I, and, and it's all done with dyes and you know, artificial cuts. And that, and it's, and that world provides real answers, but through a very artificial lens. And so as we talked about this, 
we were able to in incorporate some of those images uh, from just the my own life struggles and the day-to-day -day reality that I, you know, have as a physician. And, and then to weave those into the story. And, and an awful lot of those conversations are very much represented uh, mm -hmm. in, the, in the opera. There's even things like I asked Beck about the most beautiful or these mo or most beautiful moments and also these unusual moments in his climbing career because as Beck just uh, suggested or just me mentioned, this wasn't a one-off. He had climbed you know, on many of the significant uh, you know, climbs in the world. And he talked uh, to me about the quiet in Antarctica and how he could feel his heart. It, he could hear his heart because there's no sound there. And I, I thought that was a, and seeing three suns in the sky, this this kind of, uh, those, uh, what are they called? Do I, I, it's in the opera, but I They're forgot the name. They're called sun dogs. Sun dogs. Sun dogs, and the and that sort of wove like the most beautiful, this incredible image that he uh, described to me, and that wove in uh, into the opera as well. But uh, when he's you know sort of giving him so that the audience in the opera understands the context that this is again not a one-off, that this is Beck's, uh, that this is part of the arc of his uh, climbing. Uh, uh, climbing career. The the uh, it was you know one of the other things that we had to choose uh, or I had to choose. Um, you know what I, I think if anyone's going to since there have been dramatizations, I haven't seen the film, but I know that there's a film now and stuff. And Beck's story is clearly uh, Beck and and Jan and Rob Hall's uh, story are the are the are incredibly dramatic. Uh, stories and I can see why I you know chose them and I can see why others have as well because they're so uh, they're so compelling and and but there's but so many stories of, that of, of everyone who was there are, are very compelling and the story of Doug uh, which is also chronicled or uh, cited in the opera and his relationship to Rob Hall is something that was just sort of heartbreaking for those of you who don't know and you can speak to this because you knew him uh, back but uh, Doug was a, a climber who had climbed in 1995. Uh, he was a working class guy. Uh, a lot of the people who, who were there were uh, were uh, sort of uh, major professionals who could uh, afford uh, um, to take the time off and also the the, the sixty five thousand dollar fee in the 1960s in the 1990s. But Doug was a postal worker and he mortgaged his house. And in 1995, he he got 300 vertical feet from the uh, top of Everest, and then they, they, he was turned uh, turned around, and uh, um, and uh, uh, one of the things, one of my conversations was with Ed Vesters, who is one of the great, maybe the greatest. Beck, you can speak to this, but he's certainly one of the greatest climbers in American history. And in 1995, Ed was the uh, guide for Rob Hall. And it's like, you know, it's like uh, you imagine you're on a team and, and you're and you've hired as your support person, Michael Jordan. And uh, and when the decision was made to turn Doug around and this is actually not in the this is not in this is actually not part of the opera, but it's kind of interesting. But Doug's story is part of the opera. But what I'm about to tell you is not. But I Ed Beasters told me this when I had my long conversation with him in Seattle. They were 300, this is 1995, one year before uh, this, the climb that we're talk that's in the opera. And uh, they're 300 feet from the top, 300 vertical feet from the top. And uh, uh, Rob looks at Ed and says, can he make it? And Ed went like this, we have to turn him around. And they got him back to, uh, and Ed told me they got him back to the tents on camp four, uh, just within a whisker. And now it's a year later. And Rob has called uh, uh, Doug has sorry, Rob has called Doug multiple times and said, you can do this. You can come back. I won't charge you the extra fee. Just get yourself here and I'll get you up. The, you know, I'll get you up the mountain. And he clicks off of the line and Rob comes over to him and and says something in his ear. And all, you know, all of a sudden he's back in the line and uh, they wind up, you know, tragically uh, pushing past the turnaround time of two o'clock. They don't get to the top of the mountain until four. And then, of course, all hell breaks loose when the weather turns bad. So there's, uh, there's, there, there are, there are these, uh, all these stories are sort of converging. Um, but uh, it's well, one of the things which I found just to jump back to Beck. I mean, one of the things that just kind of blew me away was when I was asking Beck about, you know, because Beck and you can speak to this. Beck had an issue with his eyes, which um, uh, he wasn't expecting, and all of a sudden he wasn't able to see. Um, 
uh, when the sun was at a certain height in the sky. And Beck, you can describe that. But uh, when the sun wasn't at this certain height, you could see beautifully. And so he was on the balcony of Everest, which is a uh, this place that's before the, the, the summit, but this beautiful place. So again, Beck was there, I'll let him describe it. And he's talking about it. he's having this great day. Like, you know, he had, he didn't summit, he didn't get to the top, but it was a it was an incredibly beautiful experience. One of the most beautiful things uh, that you'd ever seen. Beck, why don't you can't, why don't you hand the baton to you and you can describe what it was like to be on the balcony and uh, and that experience. Okay, well, uh, I had radial keratotomy done in Dallas because uh, mountain weather and eyeglasses simply don't mix at all. And I had too many experiences where the glasses that I'd be wearing would be totally covered in ice and I little couldn't see anything other than my feet. Uh, and so I had this done hopefully to improve my uh, ability to work in that environment, but it turns out, and I didn't know this, and nobody in ophthalmology in the United States knew this. There were a couple of letters to the editor that said that, you know, we've just learned that if people go to very, very high altitudes, the vision changes dramatically, uh, and it's a metabolic injury to the front of the eye. Of course, I didn't know that, but I had, had noticed that when I got to Everest, my vision was changing uh, based on the altitude. And we started up on the summit day. Uh, and as I got higher and higher, my vision went progressively worse until uh, till, uh, in the middle of the night when we got to you know, make a traverse, I couldn't see the mountain at all. I couldn't even see my own footprints. Uh, oh. And so I knew just because I had experienced as a kid with a pinhole camera, that if the sun gets fully out, your pupils go down so far that everything is infinitely in focus. And I thought, well, no problem. I'm just gonna wait till the sun comes up and when it gets bright enough, I don't care how bad my eyes are, I'll be able to see. And so uh, sure enough, the sun started to come up, my vision improved. Uh, I go up to the balcony, which is at 27,500 feet. Uh, and I tell Rob, I've got this serious problem with my vision, uh, but I think if I just wait a little bit, it's going to be good enough that I can go ahead and finish climbing up. And he said, okay, you got 30 minutes. You get do it in 30 minutes. You're good to go. If you're not, you ain't climbing. And I agree to this. Uh, and I stay on the balcony, but in, in, when the sun comes up, it is just a gorgeous day. It is warm. Uh, it is sunny. The wind is not blowing. You're looking at the most magnificent views a human being could even imagine uh, in his wildest dreams. And as the whole world stretches out underneath your feet, and I'm just sitting there as happy as I can be. And I certainly didn't want to go down and sit in a tent. I thought, you know, they'll go up, they'll do their thing. When they come down, I'll come down with them. But right now, it doesn't get any better than this. This is just beautiful. But the, one of the things that happened, uh, everyone, is that the storm that came, it came from below, isn't it? Right back, it did not come from above. And that's why, and this was this beautiful day, you're looking up, the sky is beautiful. But I think it came off of the, uh, it, came, it came up from below. And, uh, and of course, by, you know, by four o'clock, it was getting bad. And by five or six, it was, it was really bad. And then, and then all hell broke, uh, broke loose. So well, I have a question. The, when, okay. Go ahead, well, I was just no, going to say, when this, you don't know what a, thunderstorm looks like uh, when it's beneath you. And so you're sitting there in clear blue skies. And when the thunderstorm rises up to the level you are, it just completely rolls across in the space of a couple of minutes. And you go from being in warm, sunny, pleasant conditions to barely being able to hang on to the mountain at all. It is just blowing you uh, without with such force and the driving ice into your face that you can't see. I mean, I mean, for uh, for everyone who's tuning in here and so who's watching the opera, this is an incredible opportunity to ask Beck about this. But uh, it's portrayed in the opera. But of course, Beck, as is the title of his book called Left for Dead, um, Beck was left for dead twice on the mountain, once on the on the South Pole. And uh, and as Beck said, um, um, he understand. I think there was a the person who first saw you. He was a physician, wasn't he, Beck? He was a, a I think who uh, who examined you and said made the triage decision to leave you and then of course you got up and uh 
and then and then on. But why don't you want to? This is this is just too good a chance, Beck, for everyone not to hear it from your own your own <laughs> words. Right? Like what that moment was like when uh, I mean, you told me it was very moving to me. I tried to portray it in the opera, but I want to hear it from you about when it was you know, all those hours later. You're laying, you know, in, in a coma, and you you and you wake up. What what, what happened? To the expense, well, the best, and I know and you even told me you don't know exactly. But what what's your what's your take on it? What what's how would you experience it? That you got your memory of it. Well, I went into hyperthermic coma, and I was nothing. There's no there's no thought. There's no dreams. There's there's just absolutely uh, a void. And something in that day, and maybe it's the sunshine warming on the suit, which is designed to pull in the sun. Uh, I have other explanations, but I don't know the answer. But late that afternoon, uh, how many hours? Open- Just for the for the audience here, how many hours had you been out? Fifteen hours unconscious, and right. I'd been examined. But during the time that I was unconscious, and they determined that there was no way that I could live, uh, since nobody ever had in this circumstance. So I was triaged to die. Uh, And late that afternoon, I managed to wake up and I realized that uh, I was somewhere on that mountain. I had no idea where I was uh, and that I was pretty sure that nobody was going to come out there and help me because I was, if they were going to do it, that had been there, they would have done it. And if I did not move, then I was certainly going to die. And it was a rather clear but and searing experience uh, because I really could see directly in front of me my wife and children. Yeah. And it sounds so cliched, uh, but I would put to you the notion that if you absolutely knew, and I did, that I was going to be dead within an hour because the sun is 15 degrees above the horizon and moving down at 15 degrees an hour, that when the sun hit, it was over. Yeah. What would you think about if you have one hour to live and you know that you're going to be dead at the end of that hour? What do you think about it? And that's what I thought about. And it absolutely drove me to my feet. Yeah. And I didn't care whether I fell and could not. I just was going to move until I physically, mentally, spiritually could not move any longer. And I was driven uh, to stagger and stumble into the direction of the wind. And that's how I kept my going in one direction because I thought the camp had to be upwind. So I just kept the force of the wind on my face. Uh And even though I couldn't see more than about six feet, I could just keep moving as long as I kept my face into the wind and then I walked into the camp. Yeah, it's just it's just an incredible story. I, one other aspect of the opera, just to share with you with you all, is that um, you know one of the things that I've learned about mountain climbing and about Everest in particular is that it it resembles baseball in this one way, which is that it's uh, the, the history of everyone who played is like is always on the field. Like you know, for those of us who love baseball, we're thinking about like you know that catch that Willie Mays made when I was at Candlestick Park in the 60s or, or these, you know, you just, you're thinking about and then Babe Ruth and all of the history. And the thing about Everest is that um, more than um, almost anything, uh, Everest, the history is all there because the um, those who perished on Everest are still there. And that was one of the sort of points of departure for the telling of the story is that as this action is taking place, people are walking through um, uh, the, the the remains, the bones, the the dust of, of those who came before, and it started in nineteen. Well, the first uh, expedition was nineteen twenty four, but they did a, a survey expedition in nineteen twenty two, and in nineteen twenty two, some uh, Sherpas passed away in that in that thing, and then of course Mallory Irvine and Mallory famously passed away in uh, uh, twenty four in that uh, in that expedition, and uh, and then. And then, uh, and then many others over the course of the piece. So, as you'll see, and when you're seeing, if you haven't seen it before, there's a chorus that um, it's it's it. I I, I wouldn't. Ha- I don't know if Greek chorus. I don't know what that 
you know, if that really conjures what it really is. But you, you, there is, there seemed to be like the spirit of the mountain or the spirit of the some sort of omniscient spirit. And at the end of the piece, you do, you discover that they are the, uh, they're everyone who died on Everest. And when Rob and Doug die, the way their deaths are announced is they become part of the chorus, and they come to get Beck uh, because, but Beck has other ideas, and as he just described, he's walking uh, away from. Uh, Away from death and into uh, 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 to to the salvation of the camp and to be re uh, ultimately to be reunited with the world and his family. So it's uh, um, you know, it's quite a I think it's a dramatic telling, but I think it's one of the things that uh, that I wanted to portray and Joby wanted to portray was to have a sense of the history of this uh, of this mountain. I mean, for those who are there's so many wonderful books. I mean. Uh, Beck's book, John's uh, Krakauer's book, talk about the uh, 96 expedition. But there are wonderful um, uh, book. I read a lot of books about this, the whole experience. And uh, there's one that's called Into the Silence, which is about the 1924, uh, about Mallory and, and Irvine, which is really a fantastic book. Um, uh, I forgot who wrote it, but it's it's a, we, can, we can sort of post it. But it's a great, another great book about it really contextualizes how this all began as a sort of response to World War One and how these these guys who had experienced World War One were uh, uh, couldn't stop you know, their, their sort of inner clocks and needed some sort of stimulation. And then when uh, the Chinese government opened up Tibet, they were able to um, start uh, trying to go uh, for the tallest mountain in the world. So that's that's what. So the history of this is also sort of woven into the piece. It's not we don't hit it too heavy. I don't think in terms of it's not a history lesson, but it's it's also. It's part of it. My, in, in, in large measure, mostly this is about the, the, I always say operas are really emotional archaeology. That's kind of what they are. They're, it's not, it's not uh, telling you the, we're not, we're not doing a documentary. Uh, if you want to know what happened, blow by blow, read Beck's book. That'll, that'll tell you what happened blow by blow. What we tried to do is use the, the majesty of music and the human voice to uh, describe what it felt like. Uh, and uh and so that's it. I will ask you this, Beck. You know, this been you. You've, obviously, this is an incredibly famous story now. It's almost it's become part of the cultural, you know, fabric of uh, the world at this point, and the world. I mean, all over the, all over the world. What I'm I'm not asking about the opera. I'm not. I'm not. I'm just saying what what do we not get, and what uh, what can I guess? Obviously, we can't know what it's like to be uh, in the experience you had. But what has uh, the world got wrong about what happened there. Well, I, I think they don't generally get a, a clear notion of just who these individuals were. Right. Uh, it's easy to paint this in kind of broad, stereotypic mm -hmm. ways uh, without being able to uh, see Doug, uh, uh, see Yasko, mm -hmm. Anamba, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Rob and his dying call to his wife. I mean, the sheer humanity of these people is, is you know, it, it, these are people you, you know. Yeah. Uh, these are good human beings. These are caring individuals. These are not a bunch of adrenaline junkies who got to. Oh, no, I, I, I really, yeah, I really got that sense. A, a mountain. I mean, in my own case, I was turning 50. The likelihood that I was actually going to summit was pretty dead gum low. The, by that time, the summit ratio was maybe 15% of individuals each year who'd try would, at that point, could manage to get up there. And that's all comers. You talk to a 50 year old guy, that's not going to be in the top tier. Right. Of who's going to hit the summit first? You don't go there to do that. You go to experience it. You go to be part of the mountain, be part of its history, be part of the uh, Buddhist culture. Uh, you know, this, this just whole mythic of this place. Yeah. Uh, and each of the individuals who are there are real people. Uh, I, I felt that. Yeah, I, I really felt that about, about, about everyone that I talked to. and. And 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 also just even intuitive, like with Rob, I mean, I also think there was a class aspect of this too. I think Rob's, you know, desire to help. I mean, Rob, Rob's help, desire to help. I'm sorry, uh, to help Doug get up 
uh, even without him bringing him back without having him pay the full fee and and so forth. There was he really I mean the road to the hell is truly paved with good intentions. I think he really wanted to Rob to uh, sorry I keep uh, fixing the fiddling with the names. Rob wanted to help Doug get to the top, and it, it and it was motivated by the best um, you know best intentions. And the you know the reason why Jan wasn't there for those of you who don't know Jan was a doctor. And she normally went on these expeditions, but she was, of course, pregnant with their first child. And uh, um, so who has since uh, summited Kilimanjaro? Sarah. Uh, Sarah who is, did. Yeah, she did. She, she, she's now, whatever, 1996. What is she? She's 24, 20, what, a 27, I guess, right? And uh, she got to be going on 27. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so she, um, yeah, right. And so she actually, I don't think she's going to do these uh, death zone uh, 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 treks, but she did actually because her, her father had done it and she wanted to do it. So it's, uh, she's very much around and, uh, and that's, that's what's happened. So, uh, well, um, maybe we should, uh, I don't know, should we uh, uh, open it up to questions or there was a yeah. clip you want, you want to play a clip for everyone or, or just yeah, I think that, would, I think that would be a great just idea. Wait. Oh, yeah, I could have done it in the context, but the, I think the clip that is going to be shown is a from this incredible uh, graphic novel uh, uh, version of the opera. And this is, uh, this is uh, as if I believe it's, uh, I'm correct, this is the section where we, where Beck and I, we talked about earlier when Beck described being on this, on the, on this, on the um, balcony of Everest, when he, he couldn't uh, go further, but uh, rather than being depressed about it, he was taking in the beauty of of all that was around him on this on this gorgeous day. So we'll play this little clip, and then we'll ask some questions. Yeah, I'll we'll play this, and then we'll open it up to questions. If, uh, as some folks are already doing, if you have some questions, feel free to put them in the chat, um, and I will ask them ask them for you. Finally, I step up onto the balcony of Everest. The sun is coming up, no shadows. Every peak but Everest itself is below me, rolling gently like waves on an ocean of forgetful. So there's a little little, uh, a little nice sample. Little sample of uh, what's going on. So and you anyway, can see in there the uh, the other sort of characters or figures that were surrounding back in there was what Gene was referencing before as the souls of the mountain, and that's how they're portrayed in in uh, Op's version as the these uh, sort of ghostly figures that surround surround the characters as and uh, they they sing the chorus parts in in our version. Um, in, our, yeah. in the original in the original version, just this the, which we're not we're doing here, but. Uh, that at the end, all of the names of everyone who's died on Everest are projected on the set. And then we add um, Rob's name and, and Doug's name. And you can see this, these hundreds of names of, of those who are still there. So there was some, there was some talk of trying to, to uh, bring Rob's body down because they know where it was. And that's another whole story. And Jan said, just leave it. You just, just, it's, it's, no one should risk their lives going up there in order to do that. So that's, that's what happened. So anyway, I'll be quiet and answer any questions. <laughs> uh, so I think the first question we had was from Evelyn uh, for Beck. Uh, what was the other near-death experience that happened on Everest? I think uh, Jean mentioned there was two times that, that you were left for dead. Uh, could you when you were in the tent, Beck. When the, this, when yeah. when well, actually, there were uh, three times because when Anatoly Bukharev came out and brought in the Fisher climbers that were part of the huddle, uh, he also uh, basically de declared that Yasko and I were beyond saving. And mm -hmm. so we were left at, at that point. Then when the doctor out of our group came and pronounced that we were beyond salvation, uh, that was second time. 
And in the third time, I managed to get to camp and they placed me in a tent alone uh, to die because they were absolutely certain I could not possibly live through the night. And nobody wanted to have any part of having to experience that. And so I wound up uh, in some very difficult circumstances in the tent alone, uh, abandoned because they knew I was dead. And so they were very surprised when once again, the following morning, I was still there. And uh, I guess I just, you know, ever ready battery, I just die hard. I just didn't, didn't was not going to give up on that. So uh, it is, there were multiple opportunities that things could have changed, but in the grand scheme of things, I, you know, I, I came back and life is good. And the being able to come back to my family after that, I always say that if you can't learn something from by dying, you're a really slow study. <laughs> oh, good line. Thank you, Beck. Um, the next question we have is from Stacy. As for Jean, um, how did you choose how many people's stories to portray in the opera? She says the opera feels so balanced with a focus on the two main storylines, but was there another person's story you were considering including? Oh, that's a great question. And, you know, it's the reality of opera and how many soloists you're allowed to uh, have for a particular production. It's just the, the dimensions of the budget and all those things come into it. Um, uh, I think, well, Scott Fisher's, you know, uh, story is also, there's so many dramatic stories that are, that are taking place uh, because all these people you know, who, who passed away and who were, we're doing all of uh, doing their best. I mean, I think um, it's why Scott Fisher's widow and her, his daughter came to the production in Everest, and they were very they were very moved, and they weren't upset that he wasn't portrayed. Actually, they just liked the entire uh, show. I was very uh, gratified by that. But um, I think I think that that is um, you know I. I don't know. I, I I don't really think about it. in this particular case. I don't think about what we missed. I just think about what we did. Um, but there are other stories, and again, they're 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 beautifully chronicled in a lot of the books um, uh, about sort of people's uh, people's lives there. So, thank you. Uh, the next question is from Michael. Uh, I, th I think this one is uh, aimed at Beck. Uh, he says, "I have heard reports of people passing by." dying climbers in order to reach the summit as is typical of me thought how callous and inhumane i'm beginning to change my mind but how does one justify leaving a human to die it's a, it's a big question <laughs> well it is a big question in some cases it is just that it's it's callous and it's horrible and it shouldn't happen and uh, morality doesn't stop at a given altitude and and you can't, you know, forgive uh, actions where they could have actually helped somebody. But part of this is there are certain things that we know to be true that aren't. Uh, for instance, that one of the reasons that I was left to die was because it was absolutely known as a truth that once you've gone into this stage of hypothermic coma, nobody has ever lived through it. And so to a certain extent, that's self-fulfilling. So if you have somebody that's in that level of extremis and you leave them, they die. Uh, and so, you know, you have no idea if really if somebody could have come back if you helped them out. But, if the, but you can't also realize just how exhausted, how numb, how mentally uh, you know, paralyzed, you become with the hypoxia and the drive. Uh, it is, it becomes very, in some ways, very animalistic. Uh, mm -hmm. And you hope that in bad moments that you'll rise above that. Uh, you hope that, you know, if, if you get into horrible circumstances, that you'll behave as an honorable person, but you don't always know that. 
You don't know until you put yourself in that circumstance and then you see how you respond. And we would always like to think that we would not be somebody who would uh, not do you know, for others what you would want done for you, uh, but you really don't know until you put yourself out so far and you feel so vulnerable uh, in these moments. Uh, yeah. Part of it, in, you know, people don't want to take you back because the effort to do so endangers your life. That's right. Uh, I was about, and so I was gonna, that's frightening. I was going to say that, you know, on it's as Beck just said, I mean, clearly it's, it's, each, it's it's like a fingerprint. Each one is different. Each situation is different. Um, in in Everest, the, Rob Doug dies, and Rob is very strong, you know, professional climber and and has incredible will to live, and he lives even longer. And and as one of his last conversations, he says, "Send someone up for me in the morning. I'll make it through the night," which of course is not true, but they do. I don't know, this is not part of the opera, but the, the base camp, they do send, they, they take some thermoses and they head up to try to get to, they know where he is, but they can't make it. And at some point they turn around because they're going to, as Beck just said, they're going to be risking their own lives to save uh, Rob, who is, uh, you know, uh, almost certainly dead at that point. So it's, it's there's a, I'm sure there's a, there's a calculation that's happening. It was happening uh, on that day. Um, about who they, um, you know, who uh, who could be saved, and I bet Bukharev, you know, was, you know, how many? I mean, Bukharev, so that's a whole other story too. I mean, his, I mean, which I won't go into now. But you know, after rushing down the mountain because he wasn't using oxygen, uh, and then and then going to, going to the South Coal, I mean, he could only, he could save only as many people as he could save, and that was also because of, you know, maybe because of how he climbed, uh, so that there's. These things sort of like they, they cascade on one another, but it's uh, it's complicated and each situation is different, I think. It's just my take from li living with this for so long. Thank you. Um, so the next question uh, is from Bruce. And uh, she, men she mentions, and I'm not sure who this person is, but there is another person on the Zoom apparently who has been on Everest. Um, and maybe they could, would like to answer this as well oh, as cool. Beck. Um, but uh, she asks, "What for, for those who have been on Everest? What is what is the motivation to go? Like, what what drives you to go?" And I think this is something that uh, is sort of the big question of the opera as well. Like, why why do people do this? What drives you to go to Everest? Zippa, can you unmute yourself? <laughs> yes. Okay. Golly, this is so amazing. Um, first of all. My story is a little bit, uh, quite a lot different, actually. Um, I had always dreamt of going to Everest Base Camp. I didn't actually want to go any higher. Um, and I have two sons, and we were coming back from New Zealand, and we'd had our shots, and we were ready to go. Uh, they were quite, quite little. But anyway, uh, I was then called back uh, to a job uh, at the National Ski Academy, and I thought, okay. it doesn't matter. We can do this any time. And... Um, Shortly after that, I was uh, diagnosed with MS. I ended up in a wheelchair. And um, my sons kept saying, well, we're going to go to Everest Base Camp. We're going to go to Everest Base Camp. And I kept saying, really? I don't think so. And they discovered something uh, called a trail rider. And uh, in 2006, um, uh, they gathered a team together. And uh, they took me to the base camp of Mount Everest to get the trail rider, which is the a cross between a rickshaw and a wheelbarrow. And uh, we got to base camp. Uh, but having said that, uh, I feel a bit silly telling this, this story. However, I understood so much of what you were saying. It's the challenge, it's the people, it's the journey. Um, since my life changed uh, going into wheelchair. Uh, everything is up before Everest or after Everest because it was monumental in our lives and a huge challenge and uh, a, an amazing accomplishment. And it also, it was the team that got me there. And it was tough because yeah. of the altitude, 
and uh, they did they could have actually gone by themselves they didn't have to push push me um so yeah that was my Everest base camp trip yeah but anyway nothing compared with I'm loving so everything you're saying uh, I've followed you so much um and I think the opera is going to be amazing we're very lucky because we're coming uh, next week so thank I'm you welcome. wonderful thank you Pippa that's brilliant thank you Pippa. Did, you want to did you want to respond back well that that is once again a when I was the point that I was making about the individuality of every story of the people who go there this is not some monolithic uh event and some often when it's portrayed in in television uh, they this, they flatten all of this out so that you don't have any idea of the kind of struggles that people have and what they put and what they project uh, into the significance of, of their own struggle to do this. Because I know a lot of people who summited Everest, and for the most part, nobody gives a rat's patootie about any of that. You know, you may think it would be a big deal, but it's not. Uh, that that most all of this is done not for somebody else. It's done for the struggle that you have in your own life and your own view of, you, of what you're capable of accomplishing and and what kind of person are you when you do this. That you know that as I, I was trying to state this earlier and probably didn't make it clear is you climbing. You get harder and harder and harder goals, uh, uh, and each time you put yourself out to a place that you've never been before, and each time that you do it, you don't know how you're going to react, and that is part of the mystery of doing it, is just to see what, who am I, what kind of person am I, well, if things get difficult uh, and it gets hard. Uh, Am I going to be a good person? Am I going to be who I would like to be? Or am I what I fear I might be? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and so that, that's, that's the struggle that you have. Yeah. Thank you, Beck. Um, Anyone else having been uh, to base camp or climbed it? I won't tell my story. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we, we do have a little more time, we've got really about 10 more minutes or so, we don't want to keep our guests too late, they are on in uh, later time zones than we are in, in San Francisco, um, but uh, before I ask this next question, um, if anyone does have questions and can't use the chat or is having difficulty using the chat, um, I will open it up for folks to, to just ask questions verbally as well. Um, but I have uh, one more question here uh, from Cheryl um, for Beck. And she asks, uh, do Everest alumni, so to speak, uh, tend to get together frequently or do they tend to hold the experience more in an isolated memory? Uh, they hold it in isolated memory. This yeah. is this is not a, a get together with a big rah-rah. I mean, like I said, you, you do this for individualistic reasons. Yeah, that Yes, it's selfish. Uh, anybody that goes there and puts, this, puts themselves at risk and the and in so doing also risks other individuals, your family, uh, your wife, your kids, uh, and all of the other people that love you. It, it's a selfish event. There's no way to get around that. Uh, but you also, at some level, are, you feel driven to do it. Uh, and whether that's healthy or not, uh, it's. It, I think it is common within the individuals that do this. I don't care how laid back or all shucks they may be. These are driven people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, would anyone else like to ask a question? Uh, you can, if, you, if you would like to just unmute yourself and ask a question to either of our guests. We have a little more time. I say one one of the things about doing these projects, the, the project like this, is that you know it is, um, you know, who, who are the people you meet along the way, and uh, this has been a particularly uh, wonderful project. Of course, uh, Nicole uh, conducted the premiere, and uh, so and that's how I got to know and become such good friends with 
Nicole and colleagues, and now we've done a number of projects, including recently the English National Opera that she just conducted. But of course, getting to know Beck uh, and uh, Neil Beidelman, uh, who's not portrayed in the opera, but gave me lots of information. He's uh, one of these and, and others um, has just been a real, uh, a real joy. And just, you know, it's, it's, it's funny. I feel the same way back when you said it was easy to talk. Like we talked before the, the Zoom talked and it's like, it's like, like an old friend you just sort of resume the conversation with. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's been one of the nicest uh, things about that. And of course, working with Joby, we're doing another opera right now for, da for Dallas Opera actually, for based on the Diving Bell and the Butterfly, which is gonna open in the fall. And uh, it's all because of what happened. And, and also because Beck kind of opened the way for this. Without Beck, this never would have happened. I really used Beck as leverage, as I said at the beginning of this, to get to the other people. And I needed all that information uh, in order to do it. And so you just need that one person who uh, sort of opens the door. And in this uh, particular project, there was certainly Beck. So uh, it's great to see him again and, uh, and to see the piece happening here. And uh, it's also happening in London, uh, a stage version, a um, concert version with the BBC Symphony and the BBC Chorus is happening uh, next June and Nicola is conducting. So that'll be uh, wonderful as well. So we've, we're, it's been a it's been a really uh, happy project, one I'm really proud of, and uh, and also it's been a lot of fun. So any other questions? Um, there is a couple in the chat, and I have one quick one myself personally <laughs> that I would love to ask. Um, I'm I'm gonna just go and jump in and throw that one in there quickly. Uh, this for Beck. Um, so your story has been told in so many different mediums across across the years, the films and the books and and an opera, and now an immersive opera. Uh, what what is that like? I can't, I can't even imagine what it must be like to see your own story on you know presented in in so many different ways. Well, it's it started off as a very interesting media experience because this was the first time that a story had ever broken worldwide on the internet. Uh, there were no reporters or cameras or anything up there. And so the, as people learned about this, it was being followed in real time uh, on the internet by real time reporting. And so in that sense, it was a very unique uh, introduction to the world of the story uh, by a totally new form of uh, reportage. Uh, and it's been in, a dozen books, three movies, uh, and of course the, the most unique one of all, which is the opera. And now it's uh, it wound up as a graphic novel opera, uh, which is, takes it beyond uh, the my expectations for any of this. And I'm just, I love to see into other people's worlds and the creativity and the artistry and the magnificent voices. Uh, and so I was. I went listened to the opera again today via the graphic novel, and I was. Uh, each time I see it in different modes, I see something new, uh, because some, when I saw it initially, I was overwhelmed by the magnificent staging, just the physical presence, and then I heard it in concert, and then listening more to the voices, and then you see it in the graphic novel. Uh, and you're able to, to follow a story better than you can in either the other media's uh, presentations. And of course, I'm sitting there with my big headphones on and the voices are such that I can, the person is sitting in my lap as I listen to them sing. And it's just so magnificent. And, it just, uh, and like I said, each time it, it, I watch it, it grips me. It is so emotional. Thank you, Beck. Yeah, and and I think in the immersive version, it's going to be, you know, even more so that you'll really feel like you're you know, in in the in the experience with with you, which is going to be very exciting. Um, I have uh, one more question here uh, about about the opera itself and about new opera and how often um, there there are changes that happen during uh, during the process after a number of performances. Um, and this person's wondering were there changes in Everest uh, after the after the first few performances, um, and if so, what changed and why? Um, the, the, uh, changes do happen in operas, um, uh, but not that much changed in Everest in terms of the score and the libretto. I, I might be 
missing something, but I don't, um, uh, this actually, um, this this piece is, is pretty much the way it was, the, the, that is the material is pretty much the way it was on opening night. Um, but that doesn't, you know, when things need to be changed, we change them. We felt that this one was solid with, with um, uh, It's a Wonderful Life, which we opened in Houston, that Jake and I did, Jake Hagee and I did. We changed it, we changed it significantly by the time it got to San Francisco. And now it's kind of codified in the, in the place we like it. And what the English National Opera just did is was the, the, the version the, this, it was a different production, but it, the uh, material was what we had in San Francisco. We did three productions to get it to the West. There are there there are certain things in terms of the staging and the uh, the production. Uh, I think that I mean the director who directed this, Leonard Folia, says it takes three times to get it. You know, sort of the way you really really want it, uh, even if the production is the same, just so that the lighting and and uh, the staging and everything is really uh, is on point. And I think so that there were some small changes, but with Everest, no, we were pretty happy uh, with it. There, there might, I might be forgetting some small change that we made, but this one was pretty much, uh, uh, we were happy with it when it opened and we're still happy with it. <laughs> it's a very solid, solid work, solid tight 70 yeah. minutes of opera, which is the yeah. perfect length, I think. <laughs> yeah. um, so I'm gonna combine two questions here, both for Beck. Um, uh, the first question was uh, for Beck, whether you're still uh, mountaineering um, and also uh, who who rescued you or uh, was there someone who rescued you from the tent when uh, like from uh, when you when you were left there? Well, let me start with the second question first. Uh, when I managed to wake up in the tent still alive, uh, the camp was pretty much deserted. There were only uh, three other people there beside myself. One of them was John Krakauer, and I managed to get his attention. And he called over Pete Athens and Todd Burleson, who are both professional guides. And they uh, helped me down about a quarter of the way uh, toward Camp 3. And then the IMAX uh, film crew, David Bashirs uh, and Ed Beasters, uh, uh, were there to take me all the way back into camp too. Uh, then we hit the next day, we had the world's highest helicopter rescue. So it was, we were doing a lot of interesting things in a short period of time, but basically I walked out on my own legs. Uh, I was uh, in, still in pretty decent condition considering the degree of damage. Uh, I don't do mountaineering anymore. I wasn't holding my paws up, but the degree of frostbite that I suffered was uh, pretty severe. It took up the center part of my face, both of my hands uh, and the like. And uh, so I can't stand the, uh, the insult of cold uh, the way I used to be able to do so. And so I, I, that really is not so, the risk reward on that is just uh, not worth considering. Right. It's very unsettled. <laughs> Um, all right, I'm going to throw it open for one more question, and then we we do have to let our guests go if there is any final final questions uh, for the group from the group. <laughs> do you still keep in touch with Matt and Casey? Uh, I've not talked to him in a fair while. Uh, he's obviously an extraordinary human being. Uh, and we did have an opportunity to spend several times together uh, after that. Uh, he became quite famous uh, throughout the world and uh, famous certainly within Nepal. Uh, and he was, and when I talk about this story, my statement generally is that of all the people involved, he's the one that is most impressive to me. Uh, and some of this is, is, is kind of funny. We, we went together to see the IMAX film Everest at the Fort Worth Science Museum. Uh, and of course we're sitting there and it has you know, a, pictures of him flying the uh, helicopter, uh, one of the only people in the world that could do such a thing. Uh, and somebody was out front with a toy helicopter 
uh, flying it around. And I'm thinking to myself, these people have no idea that they're, you know, standing next to such an extraordinary human being. Uh, and one of the things that, that I remember so particularly about that, because I was, I really, you know, was very grateful to him. Uh, and he, you know, in later visits and stuff, he said, you know, uh, you're one of the very few people that ever really thanked me for saving them. Uh, I guess we just expect that our heroes are always going to be there. And for me, he was, and he's just an amazing person. Uh, and so uh, Madan is just, uh, you know, I, I, you can't give him enough credit uh, for what he did, just with, not just there, but in all the myriad of times that he helped people out and saved people and rescued people. And that's, uh, and that's true for so many of the individuals whose life's work is to do exactly what he does every day. So, no. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, I think we do need to wrap it up here. Uh, I think I thank you all for um, for joining us this evening. The last question that I see here was about the recording of this this program, which we will, we will be sharing on our website um, on operaparallel.org on the the enhance your experience page, um, which is connect is has a whole bunch of resources and videos and information about the production, um, and we'll be adding this this incredible conversation. Um, so please join me in thanking uh, our wonderful guests, Jean Shia and Beck Weathers. For being with us tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you, folks. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll see you, uh, hopefully, all of you at, uh, at Everest and Immersive Experience uh, in the coming weeks. Thank you. Have a good night. Heck, I'll give you a call. I'll give you a call soon. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Take care, all.